the purpose of this tape is to take some of the mystery out of lighting, and in this instance, lighting faces. And back this way just a touch. Now tilt your head for me, tilt right there. Lighting is a physical science, and what it is is it's electromagnetic energy being emitted from a source. It bounces off your subject and is then recorded onto film or tape. There we go, right there. Well, this isn't a physics course, but some of these things need to be understood in order for a person to make conscious decisions about how they're going to achieve a certain look on film or tape. I'm in and about up in here. What we're going to try to do is to break it down into, into very simple elements so somebody can, can make some very simple decisions quickly and get the same look every time they want or to get whatever kind of look very accurately each time. Go ahead and fire that. There are three main decisions I make when I approach lighting a person's face. The first is the quality of the main light source, whether I want a very hard, uh, a hard light like raw sunlight, or I might want a very soft light, a very shadowless light like a cloudy day. And that pretty much depends on the size of your main light source and how far away or how close that main light source is to your subject. Once I've decided on the quality of light, then I need to decide the placement of that light. Where is that going to be? Should I put it near camera to flatten out? The, the lighting on the person, or maybe I want to side light them for a very dramatic look, or if there's motivation, I might even put it behind the person, that main light. So once I've decided on the quality of the light and the placement of that light, the third of these three main decisions that I make when I light a person is contrast control. How dark or how light do I want to leave this shadow that I've created on their face? Uh, if it's appropriate or if I want to create a very dramatic feel, I'll leave it dark and add no fill light at all. Uh, if that's not appropriate, I might add a little fill light or maybe a whole lot of fill light. It's kind of my mood selector and the final of these three main decisions. Before we begin the process of lighting faces, we should first establish a nomenclature, some terminology to help us examine the building blocks of light control. To specify the elements, we shall use an image of a single density object illuminated by a single light source. A motion picture or television screen is a two-dimensional surface. It has height and width, but no depth. Much of lighting for film and video involves revealing the shape, form, and texture of three-dimensional objects, such as this bust or a person on a flat screen. Let us define the three separate values that make up the elements of a three-dimensional image. The first is called the diffused value. The diffused value is the true tone or brightness of an object, and it most often determines the proper exposure of an image. In this image, we set our exposure to accurately reproduce the color of this bust. The second value, called the shadow, is that area which receives no illumination from the primary light source. The shadow is always lower in brightness than the true tone of an object, and when properly placed, the shadow will reveal the shape form, and depth of an object. The third value is called the specular highlight. The specular highlight is a mirrored image of the light source on an object, and it is always brighter than the true tone of an object. A properly placed specular highlight will reveal shape and texture of an object. There are two more areas of light control that need to be understood. The first is called the shadow edge transfer. The shadow edge transfer is the area of transition between the diffused value and the shadow. This transition edge is the primary indicator for the quality of light produced. If the shadow edge is small or sharp, we refer to the light quality as hard. If the shadow edge is large, we refer to the light quality as soft. The second area of control is the specular edge transfer. The specular edge transfer is the area of transition between the diffused value and the specular highlight, and this transition edge is the indicator for surface texture. If the edge transfer is a small or hard edge, 
Then we perceive the surface to be shiny or smooth. If the edge is a large or soft edge transfer, then we perceive the surface to be dull or rough. Facial makeup and or dulling spray are often used to reduce the intensity of the specular highlight, but those methods also change the surface texture. Other more effective methods of controlling the size and brightness of the specular highlight will be discussed later in the program. When we talk about quality of, of light, what we're talking about, the, the controlling factor of that is the physical size of the light source. Now the sun is an enormous light source, but relative to our situation, it's so far away that it appears as a very small light source, which you would call as a point source. And very small light sources produce what you'd call very hard light, very well-defined shadows, very dense shadows. Now on the other side of it, very large sources produce what we would call a shadowless or very soft light. And the reason is, is because there's so many different attack points of light. Rather than coming from one small source, it creates a well-defined shadow. Light comes from here, from here, from here, from here, and they all cancel out their own shadows. So the light tends to appear shadowless. And the nice thing about working with that is that on a person's face, there's lines under their eyes and their nose and things, maybe some imperfections. And when light strikes those, it creates shadows and it calls attentions to those things. When you use a very soft light, uh, a very soft light quality, what it does is it, it, it kind of negates a lot of those imperfections on a person's face and it can make them look a lot better, a lot easier on camera. So in a lot of situations working with real people on, on camera, I'll use a soft light source as my main light source. The downside to using a very large light source is because you've increased the physical size of the source by putting it through a soft box or or punching the light through a six by six silk or something like that, that light is being diffused. And when light gets diffused, it scatters in a million different directions. A lot of that light might end up on your background or somewhere where you don't want it. So there's a lot more work involved when you're dealing with large sources in controlling where that light goes. The other thing, the other controlling factor to the size of the light source and the quality of the light is how far away your light source is from your subject. Uh, if you take a large source and put it very close to someone, it's going to create a very soft light quality. Just like if you're standing next to an automobile and you're right next to it, that car looks very big. If that car starts to drive away, it gets very small very fast as it goes off in the distance. Well, if you take that large light source and take it 20 feet away, it's going to look a lot smaller. And in fact, the effect of it is much smaller. And that enormous light source backed way off will produce, start to produce the qualities of a very hard light source because it's a small source again. So the size, the physical size of the light source and how close you place that light source to your subject are the two main controlling factors in the quality of light. Thank you. To begin this setup, a 250 watt Lowell ProLight is set on a floor plate and directed to illuminate the background area. A small light source, an Aeroflex 1000 watt Fresnel lensed light, is set on a light stand and directed at our model Rachel. A small piece of white foam core board is then set on the shadow side of Rachel to introduce some fill light. Our first image reveals the classic qualities of hard light produced by a small light source. The shadows from the nose and chin are well defined and the shadow edge transferred has a very short transition edge, much like the quality of raw sunlight. Throughout this segment, the distance from the light source to the subject will remain constant at six feet. To increase the physical size of the light source, a single sheet of medium frost is clipped to the barn doors okay. of the Fresnel light. Our first image of Rachel revealed well-defined shadows and a hard shadow edge transfer produced by the Fresnel light. The addition of the frost to the front of the light source does little to change the quality of the light as the shadows and the shadow edge transfers remain virtually the same. To further increase the physical size of the light source, a Lowell L-frame is attached to the light stand and two sheets of light opal frost are clipped to the frame. Behind the frame is an open-faced 1000 watt Lowell DP light. The addition of the frost to the Fresnel light did little to change the quality of the light on Rachel. By increasing the size of the frost and moving it away from the light source on the L-frame, the effective size of the light source increases significantly. Our third image reveals that the shadows are still well defined, but the edge transfers have become slightly larger. The light quality has become softer. To create an even larger light source, 
A Lowell Reefa light is placed on a stand and directed at Rachel. A Reefa light is a portable umbrella style soft light with a built in 1000 watt lamp. The 31 by 31 inch front diffusion material produces a soft, evenly diffused light. The third image revealed the slightly softer light quality produced with the opal frost on the L frame in front of the light. With the soft light of the Reefa light, the quality of light changes dramatically. The well-defined nose shadows have disappeared, and the shadow edge transfer has become much softer. To show the effects of a larger soft light, a medium Camara light bank is used. The Camara light bank is a portable, collapsible soft light that can be used with virtually any light source in the industry. This 34 by 46 inch light bank is set up with a single 750 watt Lowell total light. The rear flaps of the light bank can be closed to reduce spill light. That's really it's focused. The use of the Reefa light creates a much softer light quality with a soft shadow edge transfer. The effects of the larger Camara light bank are much the same as the Reefa light, with a slightly larger source producing an even softer shadow edge transfer. The soft edge transfer reveals the shape and form of the model's face and gives it a soft, natural look. Finally, to create an even larger main light source for the talent, a four foot by four foot frame with diffusion fabric is attached to the grip arm of a C-stand. This frame, normally referred to as a silk, is then illuminated from behind by a 1000 watt Lowell DP light. In this setup, the DP light is the source of origin and the diffused light passing through the silk becomes the true source of illumination. To maximize the effect of the large light source, the silk is placed as close as possible to the subject. The image of Rachel, illuminated by the Camara light bank, shows the soft shadow edge transfers normally associated with large source lighting. With the use of the open face light and the 4x4 silk, the quality of light remains virtually the same. The use of a heavier, denser diffusion fabric on the silk frame may have further improved the soft, wraparound quality of this lighting setup. Returning to the first image of Rachel illuminated by the Fresnel light, we can see the obvious difference in the light quality produced by a small source. The well-defined shadows and the hard shadow edge transfers sharply contrast with the light quality produced by the larger, softer light source. Clearly, the physical size of the light source is directly related to the quality of light produced. The larger the light source, the softer the light quality. But size alone does not dictate light quality. This image of Rachel demonstrates the quality of light produced by a medium Camara light bank with a light source at a distance of five feet from the subject. As we will see in this segment, the distance from a source to the subject affects the relative size of the light source, which in turn will affect the quality of light produced. To demonstrate the effect of moving the light source closer to the subject, the light bank is moved twice as close to Rachel, to a distance of two and a half feet. The effective surface area of a light source increases or decreases by the square of the distance moved. That means when a light source is moved twice as close to the subject, the effective size of the front surface area of the source is expanded to four times the original size. With a light source twice as close, the source becomes twice as wide and twice as tall, making the source four times larger. If the source is moved twice the distance away from the subject, the effective size of the light source becomes one-fourth its original size. With a light source at five feet, the light quality is soft and there is a slight nose shadow visible on Rachel's face. With the source moved to within two and a half feet, the effective size of the source is increased by four times. Although the light quality is much softer from this light position, the only noticeable difference is a reduction in the nose shadow because the light quality was already very soft. The real effect of distance on the quality of light becomes apparent when moving a large source away from the subject. The same light bank is now moved to a distance of 10 feet from Rachel. 
Moving the source twice the distance away from the subject makes the effective size of the source one-fourth its original size. And consequently, the quality of light produced is much like that of a smaller source. A noticeable nose shadow is now evident, and the shadow edge transfer has become much more defined. A final look at the images confirms that the distance of the light source is an important factor to consider when lighting faces. Imagine an overhead view of your subject and the camera in the background uh, and a clock dial around your subject. Well, that's how we've laid this out for the placement of the light source. What we've tried to do is say a, a, a light source at 1 o'clock or 4 o'clock or 6 o'clock uh, to show you how that affects the look of the lighting you're creating. And when placing a light source, a small light source at 2 o'clock, how different that is when you go to a large light source at 2 o'clock because it is a different situation. So that kind of placement around the clock dial is critical, a critical decision to make when you're lighting a person. The other placement decision to make is how high or how low that, that light placement is to be. Um, if, you're, if you're working off an 18-foot grid and you have a very steep light placement for your key light, what you're going to end up with is, is a lot heavier brow shadows under the eyes and a lot longer chin shadow down on the neck. You may want that, you may not. If you reduce that angle and bring your light source down either on a drop pole off of the grid or, um, or work it off of a stand off of a floor, it's going to minimize that effect and you're going to end up with a much shorter shadow under the chin that almost disappears if that's the look you're trying to create. Uh, the other thing about light placements, I think it's in general uh, most DPs and lighting directors uh, place lights differently for men and for women. Uh, when I light men in most situations, I'll leave a little more shadow value on one side of their face than the other. And for a money type shot, for a big shot in a show, a close up, uh, I'll work the light source a lot closer to camera for women, flatten out the lighting and it gives them a lot more of a glamorous look. In this segment, an imaginary clock dial around the model will be used to refer to lighting positions. We will show the effects of lighting a face with small and large light sources at different clock positions. For instance, a small light source at 1 o'clock will appear like this. And a large light source at 7.30 will look like this. To begin, an airy 1000 watt Fresnel light is placed on a stand at the 1 o'clock position. Right. And the light is directed right. at the subject. Throughout this segment, the distance of the source will remain constant at six feet. The background is illuminated by a 250 watt Lowell Pro Light. Alshevnikov then works with our model Sean to capture the effects of the first lighting position. In this first image of Sean, the effect of a small source at the one o'clock position can be easily seen. Because the main light source is behind the subject's left shoulder, the light does little to illuminate Sean's face. Therefore, without the use of a fill light to illuminate the shadow area, the one o'clock position can be a nice dramatic effect, but it is not very useful as a key light position. To show the effects of a large light source at the same one o'clock position, a medium Camara light bank with two 750 watt totas mounted inside replaces the Airy Fresnel at one o'clock. With a small source at 1 o'clock, little more than the edge of our model's face was visible. By changing to a large light source, we can see that a larger rim of light is created on the side of Sean's face, and that more detail is visible in the shadow area. In this setup, this increase in shadow detail is due to the spill light from a large diffused light source bouncing off the studio walls and creating ambient fill light. To see the effect of a small source at the 2 o'clock position, the 1000 watt Fresnel light is moved into position. Perfect, thank you. With the small source at the 1 o'clock position, only the edge of Sean's face was illuminated. By moving the source to 2 o'clock, we can see that a much larger area of his face is lighted, including the side of his nose. Once again, an interesting effect, but not an attractive key light position. To show the effect of a large source at 2 o'clock, the light bank is repositioned. The Fresnel light source at 2 o'clock illuminated only a small portion of Sean's face and nose. With the use of a large light bank, the wraparound quality of a larger source lights more of the side of the face. Once again, the bounced spill light from the large source provides some ambient fill light in the shadow area. To show the effects of a light source at 3 o'clock, 
the Fresnel light is moved again. With a small source placed at 2 o'clock, most of Sean's face was still in shadow. By moving the source to the 3 o'clock position, we achieve a lighting effect that is normally referred to as side lighting. One half of Sean's face is illuminated, while the other half remains in shadow. The effect of the large source at 3 o'clock is virtually the same as that of the small source. Side lighting is a popular lighting effect for dramatic work, and its effect can be varied greatly by the amount of fill light introduced into the shadow area. The subject of contrast control will be covered in the next segment of this program. Returning to the clock dial, we will now examine the effects of a light source at the 4 o'clock position. A small source at 3 o'clock created a classic side light effect. By moving the Fresnel light to 4 o'clock, we can see that light from the small source begins to illuminate the front part of the subject's face. The wide nose shadow can be reduced by increasing the height of the light source at this position. With the large light source, the soft shadow edge transfer reduces the amount of shadow area on the front of Sean's face, making the 4 o'clock position a dramatic and very useful key light position. The small source is now moved to the 5 o'clock position, and the assistant is careful to control the light with the barn doors to keep any spill light from reaching the painted background. The small source at 4 o'clock was a dramatic and useful key light position that illuminated only a portion of the shadow side of Sean's face. By moving the Fresnel light to the 5 o'clock position, we can see for the first time that the key light is illuminating the entire front of Sean's face. The true shape of his face is revealed, and although we are working with a small source, much of the well-defined nose shadow is reduced because of the position of the source. Now the light bank is moved to the 5 o'clock position, and because of the spill light created by a diffused light source, a Camara honeycomb grid is attached to the front of the medium light bank. The lightweight metal grid velcros to the front of the light bank and is approximately one inch thick. The holes in the grid channel the light forward, reducing the beam spread of the light. The result is a very controlled soft light source that keeps the spill light off the painted background. The control of spill light from small and or diffused light sources is often a problem. In addition to the honeycomb grid, there are several other methods for controlling spill light from a source. One method is to set a black flag on a C-stand arm and lower the flag into position at the top of the source. When set correctly, the flag will cut spill light from the background area without affecting the light on the subject. If a flag is not available, a large sheet of black tin foil or black wrap can be used in the same manner. This sheet of black foil is attached to a Lowell boom stand pole. One other light control device offered by Camara is a collapsible louver system. When mounted vertically, the black ribbon louvers channel the light forward without letting light spill toward the front or back of the set. This system controls spill light with only minimal light loss on the subject. Returning to the images of Sean, we can see that the small source at 5 o'clock produced the first full face illumination, and in many instances this is a very useful key light position. By switching to the large light source, the same basic lighting effect is achieved with a much softer overall light quality. The Fresnel light is now moved to 6 o'clock, and Halshevnikov calls in the position of the light source as close as possible to the edge of his camera shot and the true 6 o'clock position. With a low lighting angle at this position, a black flag must be set to keep spill light off the background area. A C-stand with a grip arm is used to hold the flag in a horizontal position. The flag is then set at a height that cuts the light off just above the subject's head. A key light set at a higher angle would spill light onto the floor and therefore would not need a flag to control the spill. With a small source at 5 o'clock, good shadow form, or modeling, was produced on Sean's face. This key light position and the complementary position of 7 o'clock are both very popular looks with either hard light or soft light. The movement of the key source to 6 o'clock creates a very different look, one which can be flattering to the subject but can also make a face look wider than it normally appears. The lack of shadow form on either side of the face is normally referred to as flat lighting. 
This look is most often seen in fashion magazines and in news interviews shot with an on-camera light. The length of the shadow under the chin is directly related to the height of the light source. The transition to soft light at 6 o'clock diminishes the news interview look significantly. The look is still flatter than those images produced from other lighting positions, but the 6 o'clock position is still an important light placement to understand. One of the key benefits from a low angle light placement near camera is the eye light that is created from a reflection of the source. This highlight in the subject's eyes can add a sparkle or touch of life to your images, and the effect usually occurs with a low angle light placement anywhere between 5 and 7 o'clock. The final key light placement in this segment is the 7.30 position. The flag is removed from the setup, and the 1,000 watt Fresnel is moved to the camera left side of the subject. A look at the diagram shows the final placement of the hard light source on the frame left side of the camera at the 7.30 position. The flat light from the 6 o'clock position is a stark contrast to the lighting effect created by the Fresnel light at the 7.30 position. As with the 4 and 5 o'clock positions, the small light source produces well-defined shadows with a hard shadow edge transfer. Changing to the large source at this position reduces the noticeable hard-edged shadows on the subject's face and makes the 730 or the 430 position a valuable key light placement for a variety of applications. A quick review of the effects of a soft light source at the seven lighting positions just seen confirms the fact that light placement is as equally important as light quality and that the two decisions must go hand in hand in order to create the desired lighting effect on the subject. Once you've decided on your key light placement, uh, in most of the positions around the clock dial, you're going to end up with some sort of shadow value on one side of the face or the other opposite the key light. Uh, so your contrast control is a decision of how much light to introduce into that shadow, whether to leave it very dark or to introduce a lot of light into it. The, the, the source that introduces light into your shadow area is called your fill light source. And my general rule of thumb is that the fill light source should be a much larger, physically larger light source so it doesn't produce a secondary shadow. That's not the job of a fill light, it's just to introduce light into the shadow that you've placed by your key light. Uh, in some news programs and things you'll see two small sources used for key and fill. One throws a shadow this way, one throws a shadow that, and you end up with the V, the v shadow under the nose and the V shadow under the neck. Your key light is supposed to, to paint your shadow, to place your shadow, and the fills, the job of the fill light is just to introduce light into that shadow area. Now, <clears throat> That's not always possible to use a huge light source for your fill light, but in, in, in a lot of talking head situations, uh, in a lot of situations, you can use a larger source to do that. Now, in this program, we did a lot of light metering to establish some very consistent values, what you'd call lighting ratios, a one-to-one, -one, a one-to-two. And what those mean is that if we take the proper exposure of the skin tone as a value of one, a one-to-one -one would mean that the same amount of light is coming in from the fill as it is from the key. It's a one-to-one, -one, they're equal. A one to two would be half the amount of light is in the fill as the key light. A one to four would be one quarter the amount of light in the fill area as the key light. So we're using a meter to establish these so the viewer can get an idea of, gee, I, I like a one to four, or I like a one to eight, or I like a one to one, or whatever might be appropriate for what they're working on. Um, there is no right or wrong answer in lighting ratios and contrast control. I've had people ask me, uh, gee, I'm working in videotape, what's the right ratio to, to light with? A one to three, is that the right ratio? Uh, there is no right answer. Uh, it's per whatever program you're working on, whatever might be appropriate. Um, a one to 16 might be appropriate. A very, very dramatic heavy shadow might be appropriate for one program, and a one to one might be appropriate for another. So there is no right or wrong in contrast ratios. Understanding contrast ratios is an important step in lighting for film or video. Put simply, contrast ratios are measurements of brightness. A light meter is used to measure light values in f-stops or foot candles, and the separate measurements for different areas of the face are then related to each other as in a 1 to 4 ratio. For the purpose of simplifying the idea of lighting ratios, let's consider the proper exposure of the subject's key light area as the value of 1. And hereafter, all other measured values will be related to the value of 1. 
This way, we are always sure that the number one represents the subject's proper exposure from the main lighting source. The number of following one represents the shadow value. Since a reduction of light equal to one f-stop is exactly one-half the amount of light, a meter reading in the shadow area of one f-stop under the key light reading would mean that there is only one-half the amount of light in the shadow area as in the key light area. This would be a one to two ratio. A shadow reading two f-stops under the key light reading would mean that there is only one quarter of the amount of light on the shadow area as in the key light area. This would be a one to four ratio. A reading two and a half stops under the key light reading would represent a one to six ratio. To begin, Halshevnikov places a small white foam core bounce card on the shadow side of Sean. The white card is used as a fill light bouncing soft, shadowless light from the key light source back into the shadow area on Sean's face. A meter reading is taken to check the contrast ratio. The first image of Sean shows the effect of the large key light source at 5 o'clock with no fill light. The addition of the bounce card at the 9 o'clock position provides soft fill light that measures one quarter of the amount of light as measured in the key light area. This represents a contrast ratio of 1 to 4. With a small key light source at the same 5 o'clock position and the bounce card at 9 o'clock, we can see the look of a 1 to 4 ratio with a hard key light. By moving back to the large source at 4 o'clock, we can see the effect of no fill light and how the addition of fill light from the bounce card raises the density of the shadow value to a 1 to 4 ratio. When using a bounce card for fill light, the amount of fill can be increased by moving the white card closer to the subject, or the amount of raw light from the key source that strikes the card can also be increased. Here the barn door is opened on the Fresnel light to provide more fill light on Sean. Often a bounce card cannot be used for reasons of shot framing or the need of more fill light. In these cases, a 4x4 silk can be used with a second light source, or a soft light source like a Rifa light or a Camara light bank also can be used as an efficient fill light source. For this setup with Sean, the key light is a Fresnel at 1 o'clock, and a silk with a 1000 watt DP light is being set as the fill light source. The open face light is set approximately six feet behind the silk, so the light will illuminate the entire silk and create a large, shadowless fill light source. A diagram shows the lighting setup with the fill light placed nearly opposite the key at 8.30 on the clock dial. A hard key light set at one o'clock with no fill light is not a very useful image for most situations, but with the addition of the soft fill light, the look changes dramatically. This image of Sean has a one-to-one -one ratio, and in this instance, the fill light serves as the main light source, and the key light plays the role of an accent light or separation light. Reducing the amount of fill light by two f-stops creates a much more dramatic look and a one-to-four ratio. This type of lighting setup looks best when the subject can also play his face toward the fill light source. Another popular placement for the fill light source, regardless of the key light position, is at the camera or 6 o'clock position. Here the light stand that supports the 4x4 silk is moved to just outside the camera left frame edge, and the DP light is then set behind the silk. A look at the diagram shows the placement of the silk and the second light source at the camera left side of 6 o'clock. With the fill light at 8.30, the lighting on Sean was dramatic, even though the key to fill light ratio was one to one. By moving the fill light to the 6.30 position and retaining a one to one ratio, the look is very different. The image seems much less dramatic and the effect of the hard Fresnel light on the side of Sean's face appears less prominent. Reducing the key to fill ratio to a one to four brings back to the image some of the drama that was lost with the one-to-one -one ratio. One other useful position for a fill light source is below the chin. And Jorge, for this setup with Rachel with a hard key at six o'clock, a small white bounce card is attached to the end of a C-stand arm and the card is set just below the frame line of the image. 
with a hard key light at 6 o'clock and no bounce fill, the shadow under Rachel's chin is dark and without detail. The addition of the fill card under the chin raises the density of the shadow to a 1 to 2 ratio and makes the lighting on Rachel even more attractive. When a fill card cannot be used for a shot, okay, okay. a small box, soft so light can be set at a low angle to achieve the same effect. So it is now evident that the size and placement of the key light, as well as the intensity and the position of the fill light, are all critical factors when lighting faces. The separation light will be a finishing touch to the image. I'm always amused when I catch a late night sports talk show or something when you see the, the balding ex-athlete sitting on the set and he has a, a specular highlight, a reflection of his hair light source on the top of his head that's probably registering around a thousand percent on the waveform. Uh, the idea of a hair light is for hair. Uh, ideally, it will separate the subject's head from the background. Well, if a person doesn't have hair, you probably should approach this whole idea a little differently. Uh, if you still need to work with a small light source off of a grid or something for separation, you can pinch the light, the uh, barn doors down, and just get light on the shoulders to separate the shoulders from the background. And if you need additional separation, you can light the background area to separate the head from the background. If you do want some sort of a white highlight on top of a balding head, what you need to do is increase the size of your light source. And by doing that, you're going to increase the size of the specular highlight across the top of the head. When you increase the light source and the, specular, the size of the specular highlight, what you're doing is going to diminish the intensity of that specular highlight. So then it falls down within the range of a normal exposure and it doesn't register a thousand percent of the waveform. Uh, you can do this by placing a soft box on your, on your small light source or bouncing light into a piece of foam core over the top of a head. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but you're just increasing the size of that hair light source uh, to create this separation on the top of a, of a shiny surface, on the top of a, of a balding head. Uh, the nice thing about doing this kind of stuff is you'll find that this all these these techniques of increasing the size of your separation source also look really nice on on people with hair to set a separation light a 250 watt Lowell pro light with a glass diffuser is set on the light stand and placed at the 1130 position a look at the diagram shows a large key light source at 5 o'clock with a bounce card at 9 and the separation light set opposite the key light at 11.30. The first image shows Sean without separation light. There is little separation between his dark hair and the top of the background. The addition of the separation light, or hair light, creates a clear separation between Sean's hair and shoulders from the background. At this point, the hair light is one half stop brighter than the key light. To reduce the intensity of the separation light, a single sheet of light frost is clipped onto the barn doors of the ProLite. Without the frost on the separation light, the highlight on Sean's hair was the brightest part of the image. By adding the frost, the intensity of the hair light was reduced by almost a full f-stop. The separation effect becomes more subtle, and the focus of the image returns to Sean's face. To further reduce the intensity of the separation light, the side barn doors are pulled out and the top and bottom doors are pinched down. With the barn doors of the hair light open, the separation effect of the light was effective and subtle. With the doors pinched down, the intensity of the light drops significantly. Sometimes when the hair light is reduced to such a small amount of light, the effect almost seems negligible. But if the light is turned off, we can see just how important even the smallest amount of separation light becomes. An additional or alternative type of separation is the rim light. To add to the existing separation on Sean, a 300 watt Airy Fresnel light is set at a height of four and a half feet at the 11 o'clock position. A single sheet of light frost was added to the barn doors of the light. Without the side rim light, the right side of Sean's face is in shadow. With the addition of the rim light, most of the shadow value is filled, and a very different feeling is achieved. A rim light is often used to simulate a feeling of raw sunlight on the back of the subject. The intensity of the highlight on the side of Sean's face can be reduced by either raising the rim light source or increasing the physical size of the source. One other method of achieving subtle attractive separation is to use a soft light source as the separation light. 
For this setup, the barn doors are removed from the Airy 300 and an extra small Camara light bank is attached to the front of the small Fresnel light. The back flaps on the light bank can be closed to control any spill light if needed. The light bank is then positioned closer to the back of Sean at the 1130 position. Once again, with no hair light, Sean's dark hair blends with the background. With the addition of the soft separation light, good separation is achieved on the hair and the lighting of Sean is complete. But what if the subject has no hair? How then do we create separation between the subject and the background? To create a separation light for this setup, a 300 watt Fresnel light was attached to the arm of a C-stand okay, and That's suspended directly going. behind our subject, Mike. In this first image of Mike, only a single key light and some bounced fill light are used. There's no background or separation light on. Still, there is some tonal separation between the top of Mike's head and the background, and very little separation on his shoulders. By turning on the hair light, good separation is achieved on Mike's shoulders. But because there is very little hair to light, we see a specular highlight or mirrored image of the light source on the top of Mike's head. The intensity of the highlight is far too bright to fall within the normal brightness range of the image, so all detail is lost in the highlight area. One solution to this problem is to clip a single sheet of light frost to the top half of the barn doors on the separation light. By adding frost to diffuse the top half of the light beam, only the light that strikes the top of the subject's head will be reduced in intensity. With the raw separation light on, the intensity of the highlight is far too bright. By adding the frost to the top of the barn doors, the intensity of the hair light is reduced by three quarters of a stop on the head and yet the separation on the dark suit remains strong. To increase the physical size of the separation source, the barn doors are removed and a small Camara light bank is attached to the front of the light. Working with the camera, okay, Jorge, Halshevnikov then calls, calls in the position of the light bank. Right when using there, a larger yeah, source for a separation light, much of the achieved yeah, separation yeah. comes not from the intensity of the source, but from the reflection of the source on the subject's head or hair. Therefore, the source should be set low to create a reflection on the subject's head. Working with a small separation light, we can see the direct reflection of the small source on the top of Mike's head. By increasing the physical size of the source, the size of the specular highlight on Mike's head increases proportionately. By spreading the light energy from the 300 watt source over a much larger area, the highlight reduces in intensity and falls well within the range of the image. Detail is now visible in the highlight area, but some separation has been lost on the shoulders. To increase the amount of separation light on the shoulders only, a second 300 watt Fresnel is placed at the 1130 position, and the barn doors are pinched down to control the beam of light. Using only the light bank for separation, there is only minor separation between the subject's shoulders and the dark background. By pinching down the barn doors and leaving the light undiffused, the second instrument can be directed to light only the subject's shoulders. When needed, the secondary separation light provides a strong line of separation between Mike's shoulders and the background. Another alternative method of creating a soft separation light is often called a goal post. A six foot by three foot white reflective panel is attached to two light stands and raised up behind the subject's head. The reflective panel is angled toward the subject and one side of the panel is then backed away from camera. Behind the bounce fill card at Mike's side, a 650 watt Fresnel is placed and the light is set to evenly illuminate the separation panel. Without a hair light, the subject lacks separation from the background. With the goal post setup turned on, a soft, subtle separation light is added to Mike's head and shoulders. This technique can also be achieved using a sheet of foam core board for the reflective panel, and it looks terrific on people with or without hair.
there's a, a big difference between lighting for black skin and lighting for Caucasian or white skin. When you're lighting for white skin, what you're relying on is in shadow form to reveal the shape and form of, of a person's face. You're placing shadows that will reveal the, the, the shape of their face. When you're dealing with black skin, that no longer applies, especially very black skin, because what, what's going on is that the, the, the tone of their skin is black and your shadow is black, and so you can't rely on that shadow to pull out the shape of their face. If you light a very black skinned person with a small light source, it's just like the balding head. What you're going to get is a reflection of that light source, a specular highlight that's going to be very small and very intense, and the rest of their skin is going to look very black. And the engineer is going to say, that highlight is way above 100%, iris down. So you're going to iris down, 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 and you say, great, that looks terrific. And you look at the screen, you have, you have coal black skin and white eyes and white teeth and, and, the, and the hot spot on the front of their face and on their nose, and that's all you're going to get. So the approach for black skin is to not try to, to, to work with traditional lighting. And what you're going to work with is what's called specular form. You're going to reveal the form and shape of a person's face through the specular highlight, through the reflection of the light source. So you need to drastically increase the size, the physical size of your light source and move it way in close. You might have to do a, a 12 by 12 silk or something like that, get it way in close and what you're going to do is coat the front of that black skin face with the reflection of your light source with that specular highlight. Because the specular highlight is increased and spread over the whole face, it's going to reduce in intensity and you're then setting your exposure for that highlight area. And you can obviously see detail in it because it's not nearly as intense as it was. So now you've revealed the form and shape of a person's face through this highlight, through this specular form. If the other side of their face, the, the shadow side of their face is still very black, you introduce what's called a secondary specular highlight, a second reflection of a light source that will then outline another area with a reflection of that white source to again reveal shape and form of their face. So it's a, it's a whole different ball game when you're dealing with black skin. You're going to be dealing with specular form and not shadow form. To begin the lighting of our subject Derek, up, a 1000 watt Fresnel is set at the 7 o'clock position and a small source is set behind Derek for separation. The first image of Derek reveals the effects of a small source on black skin. The exposure for this image was determined by the white shirt and at this exposure the subject's skin tone appears quite dark. The reflection of the main light source is visible on Derek's forehead. The second image reveals the effect of clipping a single sheet of medium frost to the front of the Fresnel light. At this distance from the subject, the frost does little to increase the physical size of the light source and the results are nearly identical to that of the raw Fresnel. Due to adding the frost to the light, the intensity of the key light was reduced. The iris was opened to compensate for the light loss and subsequently, the hair light appears brighter. The third image reveals the effect of changing the light source to a large, soft source at the same distance. Although the size of the specular highlight on Derek's face does increase slightly, the results are much the same as with a small light source. Okay, go ahead to increase the size ahead. of the main light source dramatically, a 6 foot by 6 foot silk is set on a light stand and placed at the 8 o'clock position next to Derek. Behind the silk, a 1000 watt open faced airy light is turned on and directed to illuminate the entire surface of the silk. The third image of Derek illuminated by the large soft light at a distance of 6 feet shows the classic problems of lighting dark skin with relatively small instruments. By placing the large silk next to the subject we can see the dramatic change in the look of the image. The size of the specular highlight has increased to cover the entire side of Derek's face, which raised the tonal brightness of his skin by one full f-stop. To raise the brightness of the shadow side of Derek's face, a large fill card is set opposite the main light source to create a one to two ratio. Without the use of the bounce fill card, the left side of Derek's face is still very dark. By introducing the fill card, a secondary specular highlight is produced on the shadow side of his face. This reflection of the bounce card raises the tonal brightness on the left side of Derek's face and completes the lighting of our image. Returning to the image illuminated by the hard light with frost, we can see a dramatic change in the overall mood and in the appearance of Derek. The use of a very large source set very close to the subject is the key to lighting dark skin.
Lighting people with soft light sources is easy. Regardless of the person's age, large soft sources can make people look good on camera. But what if the subject wears glasses? One of the problems that people run into uh, sometimes when lighting faces is people who wear eyeglasses. And it can be a real problem if you're not exactly sure how to go about it. Uh, I basically have two plans that I use when, when lighting glasses. Uh, the first is when I'm dealing with smaller light sources and the other one is when I'm dealing with larger softer sources. When I have to light with a very small source off of a grid for a studio interview, a multi-camera shoot with a panel of people or something, what I try to do is, is place my, my single hard light source uh, almost directly in front of the person's nose for their close-up. For instance, if they're turning this way for their close-up, that's where I set my key up high on the grid and bring it down in straight into their face. So if they look up on their close-up, you're only seeing the hit on one, each one of the, the lenses. You're just seeing one light reflecting on each lens. Uh, I try to stay away from multiple small sources onto a person in a grid, uh, so if they look up, they don't get the stadium light look across their glasses. Now. One of the things I can do uh, to reduce the heavy shadow that drops under the chin and sometimes under the eyes with a small source from a steep angle like that is it when you go in for close-ups, uh, if, you're, if you're shooting single camera, is bring a piece of foam core, a big white piece of foam core, right underneath their chest, underneath the frame, uh, the bottom of the frame, and that key light will bounce and illuminate that white board and bounce some soft fill light under their chin and under their eyes, and usually it doesn't even show up in the eyeglasses. Now, if I'm working with, with larger, softer sources, what I try to do is, obviously, if you put it out by camera, bingo, there's this huge reflection of a soft light in the glasses. So you've got to bring it off to the side of the, of the uh, subject. So I'll bring my key, my big soft key, off to one side, and I'll walk it forward and try to get it as far forward as possible until it's a problem in the glasses, and then I'll back it off a little and lock it there. Same thing with a fill source, a big bounce board or, or a big silk with some light coming through it. Walk it forward until it's a problem in the glasses, back it off a little and lock it in there. So you're side lighting with big soft sources to get that feel and trying to go directly above their nose when you're working with, uh, with small sources. And fire it up to show an example of lighting for eyeglasses eight, with eight, small light eight, sources, a 1,000 watt Fresnel light is set at the 6 o'clock position and raised up to the height of 8 feet. The first image of Donna reveals the effects of keying with a small light source at a steep angle. The negative aspect about a steep angle key light is the long shadows under the glass frames and under Donna's chin. With only a side bounce card for fill light, these shadows remain quite dense. The positive side of lighting with a small source is that there are no light reflections in the glasses. Okay, bring in to reduce the density of the shadows caused by the key light, right here, a small white card is brought into place under Donna's chin. Without the fill light under the chin, the shadows from the key light were dense. By introducing the fill card, the shadow values are raised to reduce the contrast ratio. Also, because the bounce card is placed so close to the subject, the white card does not show up in the glass lenses. This lighting technique works well with static close-ups of people. Even if the subject looks up, only one small hot spot will show up on each lens. To light for glasses right. with larger soft light and sources, one must around. utilize side lighting techniques. To light Donna, the reefer light is started at 3 o'clock and then walk toward camera until the specular highlight in the glasses causes a problem. The source is then walked back toward 3 o'clock to a final position. The camera point of view reveals the movement of the reefer light and we can see the reflection of the source as the soft light is moved toward camera. The light is then moved away from camera, and when the highlight leaves the lens, the position is set. To create a fill light source for the shadow side of the subject, a 4x4 silk is placed at 830, and a 650 watt Fresnel is set to illuminate the subject from behind the silk. The image of Donna without the fill light source shows the effects of the reefer light from the 4 o'clock position. By adding the fill light from the 4x4 silk, a soft, even illumination of Donna is achieved with minimal reflections in the glasses. Bill Hall Shevnikov has some closing comments.
My goal in producing this tape was to present some very fundamental, some very factual and physical information about lights and about lighting people. Uh, when you're lighting a program, there can be a thousand different decisions to be made about where you place your lights and what kind of light sources. But when you're lighting people, uh, it pretty much gets back to the same fundamental ideas. The size of your light source, where you place that light source, what kind of contrast ratio, what kind of separation. It, those, those reoccurring ideas happen almost in every single lighting situation when you're lighting people. Uh, my hope is that after watching this program, a shooter can go out and make some very conscious decisions now about their lighting techniques, about how they want to produce the light for this certain interview, and hopefully the image will get very close to the image that they've set forth in their mind's eye.